Ken, if you're ready, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and go ahead and start your, your presentation. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be with you. Uh, I know many people already. I'm down on the list of who's online. I know already a lot of you. Um, and so it's a pleasure. Last couple of times I spoke to the chapter, it was live, but, uh, uh, and I actually was prepared to come up today, but we had an emergency uh, finance committee for the archaeology center today that had to be an in-person meeting. So I, think I just couldn't get away. Um, so uh, my talk is about, as you see there, H. H. Neininger, Master of Meteorites. It's uh, my latest book over there. And um, uh, the first question I usually get asked is, you know, well, what does meteorites have to do with archaeology? And the, the short answer is, if you've been to the center at all, you know, we have an exhibit on, uh, it's a new exhibit that just opened up a month, month or two ago on indigenous cosmology and astronomy. And included in that gallery are three meteorites that were found in Native American ruins in the Sedona Camp Verde area uh, that are on loan from Arizona State University. And we've had them for about a year and we moved them into a new exhibit area uh, expanded the exhibit and uh, and and kept just the three that were found in the ruins and returned the others. Um, and in the process of of uh, researching that particular item uh, and the meteorites, came across uh, that that were all owned by this gentleman H. H. Neininger, and um, did more research on him to find out that he's basically considered the father of American meteoritics. Uh, extremely important. To the field, and um, uh, and so I just kept doing more and more research on him as part of just putting together, you know, the, uh, the whole story of meteorites among Native Americans. And I uh, wasn't planning to do a book, but uh, one day I was at the center, and this woman comes in, and she was an astrophysicist and was the director of the uh, Museum of Natural History of Brazil in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And she was referred to, to me by the Sedona Visitor's Center because she was an admirer of Dr. Noniger. And she was spending her summer going around the whole uh, Southwest, uh, actually from Kansas on, uh, to go to everywhere where he was, where he lived, where he worked, his different museums, et cetera. And when she got to Sedona, uh, nobody could tell her where the Sedona Meteorite Museum had been. And so the Visitor's Center you know, scratched their heads and said, well, maybe Ken Zoll knows, go see him. <laughs> and so, as they often do. And so she came in and I told her exactly where it was. And she actually has a website out there um, that uh, shows her in front of the front of the building. And that made me kind of upset and said, gee, this guy is not only, he's world famous. Um, he's a part of Sedona history and Arizona history and nobody knows about him. So uh, working with their, with his three grandchildren, uh, and with Arizona State, and with the Winslow Historical Society, and the Sedona Historical Society, and Meteor Crater, uh, I put together this book, uh, basically a biography, H.H. H. Neininger, Master of Meteorites. And uh, it, like all my books, I, I received no compensation for the book whatsoever. So any, anytime it's sold, <clears throat> the proceeds go directly to the center. So that's the background. So let me just get into the presentation. And so here's Dr. Neininger. You see him uh, on the far left, is him as a student, then in the field, in the center. Um, so those of you who do field work, you know, like Mary Kearney and others, uh, we don't dress like that anymore. <laughs> that's, his, that's his field outfit, a tie and fancy boots. Um, and then that's him on the far right is uh, in his retirement in Sedona. But he had been referred to as the world's foremost meteorite sleuth and miner. America's number one meteorite sleuth uh, until one hits him on the head. Um, and then there was, um, uh, he also referred to as the world's most persistent stardust chaser and an infatigable collector and student of meteorites. And so that's kind of like sets the stage. Uh, he was late to education. He didn't get his uh, uh, bachelor's degree until age 27. His parents didn't believe in education. Uh, in fact, he th they thought that uh, if he got an education, it would corrupt his religion. Uh, but he found this uh, uh, McPherson College in McPherson, Kansas. It was run by uh, a religious order. And so they allowed him to go there. And he got his uh, bachelor's in biology at age 27. And then he went on, got a job at Pomona College in Claremont, California, 
uh, and he uh, worked there and got his master's in biology in 1917. Uh, right after graduation, he met uh, and married Nancy Adeline, or Addie Delph, uh, in 1914, and she became his partner. You'll see her in some of the pictures uh, as we go along here, but she became his partner um, for 60-some years, and she became a, 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 actually a, a, a master of uh, meteorites as well. Uh, I refer to November 1923 as an epiphany for Nineke. Several things happened. First, he had uh, he had seen uh, this article. As being a biologist, he would receive the Scientific Monthly magazine, and in it was an article on meteorites by Arthur Miller. And as you can see the picture down below, that's meteor crater that was in uh, that particular article. Uh, and as you'll see in a little bit, he spent over 16 years studying Meteor Crater. And this was his first exposure to Meteor Crater. Uh, but then after reading the article, just a few days later, um, he was walking across the campus with another professor. And as he, as he puts it there in quotes, suddenly a blazing stream of fire pierced the sky, lighting the landscape as though nature had pressed a giant electric switch. And he saw his first meteorite. And he had turned to his, his, the professor that was, he was with, and he said, I'm going to try to find that. And he, of course, you know, the professor, other professor kind of laughed at him. And, uh, but that, that became, that became the, the urge to start studying meteorites and collecting meteorites. Now, in that article, uh, in that issue of Scientific Monthly, there was also an article about uh, uh, Kastner, uh, Kastner uh, Caverns in, uh, in Arizona. And so he decided he wanted to see that. And uh, he had kind of, he and Addie both had kind of a wanderlust um, personality. And so they decided to take some time off from teaching and because um, uh, he got a job at McPherson College after he got his master's and decided to, uh, to do a little touring. And so he built this, uh, this house car, he called it. Um, this, he bought a, uh, a Model T Ford uh, truck chassis and he had a German carpenter make this top part, which is very similar to today's RVs, but back then there were no RVs. Uh, but there was an article in another magazine about how to create a house car. And he actually paid this German carpenter to create this thing. And it had a uh, bathroom, kitchen, um, all kind of cabinetry, whatever. And you can see like a lot of this, the uh, RVs today, the side pops up uh, to give you more space. And so they took off for a year uh, covering the Southwest. Maybe, uh, and they visited Meteor Crater, uh, among other things. Uh, as he says here, they visited the great hole in the earth, dug long before memory by a tremendous meteorite. And there's another picture of this house car coming down the road at you. Um, and so that kind of got him going. And, and while he was there, he was looking for meteorites. Well, that got him more excited. And so when he got back to school, he said to the school, you know, sitting in a classroom is kind of boring. Uh, we should have a, a student tour uh, that cross, criss, crisscrosses the country. And uh, they would get lectures uh, on zoology, botany, geology, a whole bunch of things. And, uh, and the school bought it. And so uh, they went out on a trek that covered the school year of 1927 to 28. And one of the requirements was the students had to buy a brand new two-door Pontiac sedan equipped with a large trunk. And there you see the three of the, the uh, sedans. And the fourth one is Nineigers. And so they took off. Uh, on this trip. And here's a map that shows you they started in Kansas and they went up to uh, uh, Wyoming, uh, Yellowstone. They went over to Idaho, Salt Lake City, uh, and came around through Las Vegas, Los Angeles. Uh, in Arizona, they were at Peter Crater, Jerome, Sedona, went down to Phoenix, uh, down to uh, uh, El Paso, over to New Mexico, over to New Orleans, then up and down Florida, over to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, Boston, came back to Chicago, and then ended up in Denver, which was the summer school for McPherson. They had uh, uh, a summer school at uh, Palmer Lake, just outside of Denver. And so this, this trip took 36 weeks, covered 19,000 miles. They visited 30 colleges, universities, 34 museums, 15 state capitals, numerous libraries, half a dozen mines, score of industrial plants, and dozens of institutions of scientific research. In addition, along the way, he was looking for meteorites. And he would give lectures on meteorites, and people would sell him meteorites. He would go to another city, and he would 
no meteorites. He would trade some of the meteorites he bought for other meteorites. So this was basically you know, uh, put on as a student trip. But in reality, it was an attempt uh, by him to go across the country, learn more about meteorites. Because he, when you go to uh, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago, he was visiting all the universities and all the major meteorite collections that were uh, around at that time. Now, while he was in Washington, D.C., they went to the uh, Department of Geology of the U.S. National Museum, which then became the Smithsonian, uh, the Bureau of, uh, and that building down below is the current um, Museum of Natural History. Back then it was the Department of Geology. And uh, they met with uh, Dr. Uh, George Merrill, that you see there on the screen. And he, uh, he was the head curator for the geology department. And he approached, Niagara approached him and said, hey, I, you know, I think we could find a lot more meteorites. Nobody's really looking for them. And if you would underwrite me, uh, I will go around the country and I will find more meteorites for, for the Smithsonian. And his response was, as you see there, young man, if we gave you all the money your program required and you spent the rest of your life doing what you propose, you might find one meteorite. Well, for most people, that would have discouraged him. But all it, all it really did to him was to, to kind of put a fire under him and decide, uh, I'm going to prove him wrong. And so when we got back to school, to McPherson, uh, the, the school was actually giving him an extremely lenient uh, uh, school year uh, that allowed him to actually go and, and continue to search for meteorites. But he really wanted to spend more and more time at it. And so he thought it was unfair to continue to, to teach. And with, even without a job offer, he knew that the Colorado Museum of Natural History, which is now the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, uh, that they had a, a fairly decent meteorite collection. And he decided he wanted to go there, study it, and maybe talk them into a position. Well, uh, so he left without even having a, a job. And he just took off. He and Andy just said, well, let's give it a shot. And uh, the local paper in McPherson uh, heard about it, wrote an article about him moving to Colorado. And the article got picked up by Associated Press and the Colorado Museum of Natural History read it. And even before he got to Denver, they offered a position. And the position he had, they had two choices. He could and be the curator of meteorites, uh, but he would retain the ownership of all of his meteorites and they would give him a $50 honorarium and use to the museum. Um, or they would uh, take over his, his uh, meteorite collection and they would actually give him a full-time salaried position. Well, he wanted to continue to lecture and explore, so he took the honorarium that gave him a lot of flexibility. And that's a picture of how the uh, Museum of uh, Natural History looked back in, in 1930. While he was there, uh, nearby in nearby Palmer Lake, where the uh, McPherson College had a summer school, uh, he was there a couple summers and he found uh, this... Uh, partially abandoned store. And luckily in the back of the store, they had this big saw. And so uh, when he went back to Denver, uh, he went over there and he leased that space, expanded the saw uh, and made some improvements to it. And he opened up the very first uh, cutting laboratory anywhere in the country other than at the Smithsonian. And so he opened up the American Meteorite Laboratory in 1930. And uh, so he, a lot of the uh, uh, meteorites, uh, in order for you to determine whether or not something really is a meteorite, you really need to cut it and then you polish it. So you see the saw at the top and you see him uh, polishing one of the meteorites that he cut uh, towards the bottom. So this is one of his first. As we go through here, he's the first of almost everything. And that's why he's become known as the father of American meteoritics, the study of meteorites. And what he would, he was very, very clever because uh, he, You'll see in a minute, he actually uh, amassed one of the largest collections of meteorites in the whole world. Um, he came up with a little brochure, and you see part of it there. Meteorites are valuable for research, how to recognize them. And he would go around the Midwest, uh, Colorado, Mexico, Arizona, uh, the states, surrounding states, and he would lecture and hand out these brochures. And he would usually get paid maybe a, a dollar or two for his lectures. Uh, but where he got smart was during the Great Depression, uh, 1929, 39, uh, he would give these talks and he would offer to pay a dollar a pound for any meteorites that the farmers would find. Well, during the Depression, these farmers, especially in the Midwest, they would to clear their fields, they would pull all the stones and rocks and make a big rock pile somewhere. Well, when he started going around lecturing, and then his, you'll see in a minute, he started showing up in all kinds of magazines, 
uh, these farmers were going through their rock piles and they were finding what they thought were meteorites and they con collect, uh, contact him and uh, he ended up buying meteorites. And I'll show you some, some of those in a minute. So one of his great areas of success was lecturing on how to recognize a meteorite and, and uh, paying a dollar a pound. Um, and you see there what's called the magic lantern. That's the pre predecessor of uh, the slide projector. Uh, this was a salesman uh, magic lantern that they would take around and show their wares that they're trying to sell. And he took that around to, uh, to lecture. So he had a little slideshow. <clears throat> well, as I said, he started showing up in magazines. And uh, he was in a 1937 issue of Life magazine, which is one of the largest circulating magazines in the country at the time. And uh, Part of the reason the book is a little bit pricey is that we had to buy the copyright to a lot of the images in Life Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, a bunch of the other magazines you'll see. And uh, they're still around, at least people who, uh, there are people who still own their treasure trove of photographs. And we had to pay. Life Magazine was the most expensive uh, to buy. And I, and I used six of the images in the book. But on top, when you see, um, he eventually uh, got a, a little trailer, uh, and that's being pulled by his car. Uh, and as, there's him in the, in the bottom picture sitting at the kitchen table, you know, lecturing. But it had a little kitchen, a little bed in there. And that's what he took around for the next 30 years as he was exploring. So he, he caught the attention of a lot of other papers. Uh, some, of, some of us may remember Ernie Pyle, if you were around during World War II. Uh, Ernie Pyle was a reporter, mostly famous for his World War II uh, articles when he was out in the field with the soldiers. But he also had an article, uh, a series called The Roving Reporter. And that's where you see the article uh, in 1941 entitled, Dr. Neininger will quit chasing meteorites when one hits his head. And so uh, it all went about who he was, what he does, how he finds things. And then Ripley's Believe It or Not, uh, got a hold of him and they called him the star man and, and this was also a picture of him with with the meteorite while he was still at, in colorado and then uh, there's another uh like ripley's uh, it was called strange as it seems and uh that's the same thing there there's a picture of him with a meteorite and uh out of this world dr neininger has collected meteorites and now has the largest private collection in the world so people would see this and as i was going through arizona state university's library uh, Dr. Neininger, after he retired, he gave uh, the university all of his uh, drafts of books, drafts of articles, drafts of paper, all his correspondence with museums around the world and different people. And so uh, there's about, uh, what was it? It was 63 uh, boxes, legal size boxes. And uh, I've gone through every piece of paper in all 63 of those. And, uh, and so what I found was a lot of people would read the article and they would send them an art, uh, an, a letter and say, uh, hey, I saw your your uh, article in Life Magazine or Saturday Evening Post and I think I got a meteorite. And so he would follow up. Some of them, he's got his handwriting on there that uh, follow up. Other one says no. And others are circled. So uh, he had his own little shorthand for this. But again, that's how he got a lot of his meteorites. This was a very interesting uh, little side uh, thing that he had had going. Uh, this, you know, he wrote his uh, autobiography. It's called "Find a F uh, Falling Star," and a lot of what's in uh, my autobiography in the biography is taken from that. But uh, what I found was that uh, when he wrote that book, his autobiography in 1972, uh, it was well over a thousand pages. And when he gave it to his publisher, the publisher said, "Nobody's going to buy this thing. It's too big. I'm not going to print something that big." You need to cut it down. And he was forced to cut it down to just about 250 pages. Well, as you read through it, what you find is he's talking about something and then bingo, all of a sudden he jumps to something else. And he doesn't always follow his train of thought. And there's little gaps in there and very few photographs other than of meteorites in there. So it, it doesn't give you a full flavor of just what the, what the man was all about. And so, uh, ASU uh, had a lot of that material, but the treasure trove also came from the Sedona Historical Society, where when he retired uh, and closed the museum, uh, he had all these articles from magazines and things that it was in, less of the scientific stuff that went to ASU, more of the personal stuff went to the Sedona Historical Society. And they're in basically five 
uh, three inch bind ring binders. And so while going through there, I found this magazine called Ford News from January of 1942. And basically, uh, there was a pilot, uh, Dr. Uh, or uh, Captain Holloway, and that's his plane there at the bottom. And he was with TWA, and TWA and Ford were connected because the TWA had Ford engines on the plane. And he was flying over the near the Grand Canyon, which you see up on the top. There's there's a, a Canyon Diablo over here, and Meteor Crater is a little farther back. It's not neither of these, but it's farther back. Uh, and as he was flying over, he saw all these other little holes all over the place, all these depressions. And, uh, and he had the thought that, well, maybe these are more meteorites uh, other than meteor crater. These might be more meteorite uh, craters here. And in the plane at the time was Etzel Ford. And some of us may remember the old cars, the Etzels, uh, named after Henry Ford's son, Etzel. Uh, Etzel Ford was on the plane. And, and he showed him these, looked out the window and looked at these. And Etzel said, Oh, maybe we should do an expedition out there. And so they arranged it. And what you see at the bottom is the, uh, the TWA plane landing at the Winslow airport. And they had these vehicles down below. You can see the station wagons and such. And it says TWA uh, expedition, Ford expedition. And so uh, they hired Dr. Neininger, who was very well known in Denver about it, to lead this expedition looking for meteorites. And so here you see the cars uh, on, on the, on the uh, desert uh, going to, uh, to look for these craters and the uh, edge of one. And there's Neininger and some of the people there at the edge. And so he did include this in his autobiography. It's, it has, frankly, because what he determined was that these were not caused by meteorites. But his theory was that these were giant sinkholes. And when the meteorite did impact the earth, it created such a force that the ceilings of all of these um, sinkholes collapsed. And that's what all of these holes were. So all these holes that you see at the top here were actually sinkholes. And he determined that because as he studied the profile of them, they're all basically the same and there was no meteoritic material anywhere. So it, it didn't involve meteorites, but I thought this is pretty fascinating that this, he, got, uh, he got this job and it to Ford Magazine. Uh, Winslow, I spent a good hour almost talking about that because it had a lot of connection with Winslow when I gave the talk up there. So then he even turned up in 1948 in the Saturday Evening Post. Many of us remember that. And he said in there, Neininger is a scientist, but not out of this out of a copy book. More orthodox operators sometimes look down their noses at him, which was part of his whole life, and wonder how the devil he gets so many meteorites. The fact is, besides knowing what's in the books, he has a lot of Sherlock Holmes had. He follows clues and sense with uncanny skill. And you see there, the first picture there uh, is uh, Dr. Neininger with a World War II surplus mine detector. And he was the first one to do that, to find uh, meteorites. And that's Hattie in the background, following him with the shovel and a pickaxe. Uh, so if it started ticking away, they would dig it up and see what they would find. Uh, and then his picture of him on the right with some of his meteorites, uh, he's weighing them. And I thought that was kind of a cool picture because uh, in the back, there's a photograph of a meteorite uh, that he had in his, in his office. Well, he also, as you might have guessed, uh, turned up in Arizona highways. He was in the 1942 May edition. He was also in the May 1948 edition. And then there used to be a magazine called The Desert Magazine. And he showed up in 42 uh, twice in 1948 and 1955. So again, a lot of publicity and a lot of letters in his files. It's people saying, oh, I saw your article. I think I got a meteorite. And here's just a few of the other magazines he showed up in. Um, Collier's, Newsweek, Popular Astronomy, Argosy, Liberty, Liberty Digest, Scientos, Esquire, and others. Um, and so how did this happen? Well, when you look at these magazines, some of them, they uh, have an article in there written by Neininger. So what he actually did is he would put together a lot of articles and he would submit them all over the place, the different magazines and newspapers. And sometimes they would just pick it up verbatim and give him the byline. Other times, like a uh, Desert uh, Magazine and Arizona Highways, uh, they would grab the article, but they would send their own reporter and photographer out, uh, and, uh, yeah, a reporter, and they would rewrite the article, but often with the same title. Um, but uh, that was, it was kind of a sexy topic at the time. You know, meteorites were not that well known, so the public ate up a lot of this. And they started getting into the, uh, 
you know, Martians and all that kind of stuff. So meteorites coming from this guy, you know, uh, got, uh, got a lot of people excited. So they picked up a lot of these articles. So all of these articles ended up uh, producing uh, sources for meteorites for him. And after he retired, you know, he, the Denver Post, a big article, a big, uh, they had a Sunday supplement called Empire Magazine. And the entire, uh, the entire supplement is just about Dr. Neiniger, a lot of photographs and about his, his life. And uh, that's a picture of him on the right. He's sitting at his, on a patio of his uh, Sedona house after he retired there. And um, so, so that's kind of like the background of, of what he did and where he was. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the actual meteorites that, that he found, some of the more significant ones. And I love this quote at the top. Gentlemen, I would rather believe that those two Yankee professors would lie than believe that stones would fall from the heaven, from Thomas Jefferson. And basically what that is, is there was a uh, farmer in um, Connecticut, and uh, uh, all of a sudden stones started to hit his barn, and, um, and they were coming from the sky. And so he contacted two professors at Yale, and they agreed to come out and look at it, and they wrote an article that said, yeah, these rocks probably came from, from the, uh, up above, and they might, in fact, be, you know, meteorites. And when that got out, Thomas Jefferson said that. You know, he didn't want to believe it. And that was pretty much the, the belief of the day. Uh, people just did not believe that meteorites actually came from the sky. Um, one of the most common beliefs was that if a meteorite would hit the ground, it probably was from an explosion of a nearby uh, volcano. And it threw these rocks in the sky and hundreds of miles later, it would fall and, and hit houses and other things. So that was the belief at the time. And to show you how rare they were, 1895, the collection of the Chicago Field Museum uh, only totaled 180. In Farmington's catalog of meteorites of North America in 1915, uh, he says a total, the total number of meteorites recognized by the writer in all of North America up till 1909 was only 247. Yet, uh, in 1941, uh, in this book, uh, Between the Planets, uh, he pointed out that Neininger, a modern pioneer in locating meteorites, has also been outstandingly successful. For several years, Neininger has accounted for half of all discoveries in the world. And so by 1941, here, uh, that if you remember, uh, the professor over the, uh, uh, George Merrill, over at the Smithsonian said, you'll be lucky to find one in your whole life. And here by 1941, he had half of all the discoveries of meteorites in the entire world. So how did he do a lot of that? Well, again, he was uh, giving a lecture over in Kansas and uh, this farmer, um, the Kimberly, uh, heard about it and invited him to come out. And uh, they went through their rock pile and there is uh, the uh, Kimberly sitting on the porch and there's Neiniger with his son, Bob, uh, with this pile of meteorites that they had dug up. Well, it turns out that what they found was what's referred to as the Kansas Brenham Meteorite Farm. Uh, there was a meteorite that landed uh, 14,000 years ago across Kansas and spread this long trail of meteorites. And in 1882, the locals started to discover them. They just called them iron rocks, uh, and they were used as weight for a variety of reasons. And... Um, and so uh, when he started publishing it, uh, all these Kansas people started going into their rock piles. And by 1927, he had purchased 1,200 pounds of meteorites just from the Kimberleys. And he would go from farm to farm and he'd get a whole bunch more over time. Uh, on his property, uh, there was a, uh, a uh, crater. And Niniger was always fascinated by um, meteor crater. Uh, and back then, it was not, uh, there was a whole different bunch of names. It wasn't necessarily the meteor crater. And it was uh, even the U.S. Geological Survey in 1889 did not believe it was created by a meteor. They thought it was created by a, an underground steam explosion, that there was some, uh, there was an underground lake and some magma from the center of the earth started to rise and when it hit the water, it turned it into steam and it made a big steam explosion and that's what created Meteor Crater. But he was convinced that it was made by a crater, uh, by a meteorite. And so he was always looking for more craters. And on uh, Haviland's, uh, on uh, Kimberly Farm, uh, there was a crater that he referred to as a buffalo wallow because it would fill with water and, and the animals would uh, uh, get their water there. And this is it down here, a couple of people standing in it. 
and here's Nidegger and some of his people. Uh, so in 1929, he said, I got to come back and study this. And in 1933, the Denver Museum uh, uh, offered to underwrite an expedition out there to, to uh, study it. And this sheet on the right is, is Nidegger's handwriting. Uh, one, of the, one of the amazing discoveries, in my mind anyway, as I was doing this, uh, I was in the uh, ASU's uh, vault of meteorites, uh, studying some of the uh, material there. And the curator comes up to me with a shoebox. And he says, ah, I don't know if this will be helpful to you, but, you know, here's some Nidegger's notes. Well, there were about 65 handwritten notebooks from 1925 into the 1940s of all of his collections. And you'll see it several pages along here. This is, this is like, you know, an archeological site and you find the uh, field notes from the first excavation and you get all excited about it. Well, you know, here ASU had it in a shoebox, And, you know, so when I got it, the first thing I did is I, I got the center to put it in a uh, uh, archival box. We bought archival sleeves to put each box a bit separately into it to kind of just help to preserve it uh, a little longer. And this particular crater in 1933 was the first excavation of a meteor crater ever in the world. And so it's another one of these firsts that he did. And he uh, uh, just, and this little notebook tells you about the size of the hole, and where the specimens started, what corner of the hole they were, just like you would find on an archaeological dig. And here he is digging, you know, he's got the trowel, just like we would use in archaeology, and all these little tags are where there are meteorite fragments. And we might put little tags where we'd find pottery sticking out of its side. And this is his crew, <laughs> a motley little crew over there that worked on it that he hired to, to work on this thing. So uh, he basically found this pit uh, and he decided that it was an impact of several smaller meteorites in close proximity, which technically is referred to as a swarm. And the reason it, it, he determined that is when you looked at the meteorites and he recorded it, they were in kind of a funnel shape. And so the bigger ones are towards the bottom and the smaller ones kind of in kind of a funnel shape. And so again, this was the first crater ever excavated uh, in the world to prove that uh, the crater was formed by a meteorite. Another uh, interesting one is the Plainview, Texas meteorite. Um, in 1915, the Texan found these small stony meteorites. He sent them to the Smithsonian. They bought it and said, why don't you go look for some more? And over the next two years, he collected several more. I think it was about 20 or about a dozen, I guess it says. And he sent it on. And Dr. Merrill wrote an article and said, oh, yeah, we found that this is where found in Plainsville, Plainview, Texas. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's, everything's been found has been found. And so, uh, but Neidegger, when he was driving through the area in 1933, he started knocking on farmers' doors just in case to see what would happen. And when he got to the fourth house, uh, it was the dinner time, and he knocked on the door, and this farmer came to the door, and he said in his book that he looked kind of aggravated because he interrupted, uh, he interrupting his dinner, and uh, he started to describe this, and he said he was getting more and more aggravated as he was describing meteorites, until he said, I'll pay you a dollar a pound, and immediately he left the front door, went to the back, came back with an eight-pound stony meteorite. And Niner bought it, eight bucks right there, right on the spot. And he said, do you have any more? And he says, come back in the morning. And he came back in the morning and he found several more. Uh, and this is, this is one of those in the picture there. And so um, as he went by, uh, he returned, like I said, the next morning. And by the evening, he had 26 more meteorites from a variety of farms, uh, totaling 152 pounds. They paid a dollar a pound. This one, I... I picked in particular, I thought it was interesting. A man approached Nidegger with a fist-sized meteorite that he used to throw out one of his bolts if it goes on a rampage. I only need to hit him once with this, somewhere around the head, and he quite strike down. So he purchased that one as well from the guy. And here's a notebook here. He kept all these notes, plain view meteorites. Uh, from this fellow, he bought, I uh, wrote a check for $47. He wrote a check to Riley for $12. He gave him $20 cash. This guy, he wrote a check, gave him cash. Uh, and he also, this guy wrote, wrote a, a cash, wrote a check. So it shows you how he bought it. And a couple of these, you'll see a book. Well, you'll see in a minute or two, he wrote a book and uh, that he would sell for three bucks. So he would give them the cash. And if they were willing, he'd give them this book worth $3. And so uh, this, this is just a Trevor treasure trove of how he bought these and acquired his collection. So as I said at the end there, 
repeated visits over the years to Plainview, he eventually collected 900 meteorites by 1948, where Merrill said, oh, there's nothing more to be found here. Uh, and then another crater uh, on Odessa, uh, he, uh, Texas, uh, it was similar to Haviland, and there's a, uh, the crater, the, the dimensions, even a little drawing of it. And uh, he didn't have the time to really excavate it, but he was convinced it was. So he wrote an article of popular astronomy and he said he wanted to go on record as one who believes that there is not the slightest doubt that the Odessa, Texas crater was produced by the impact of a large meteorite. So again, you know, he was, this is three meteorite craters he's studying and uh, no one else was doing it at the time. So when he was over there at Odessa, he came up with some additional ways of uh, trying to uh, find meteorites. And on the back, this is called an electromagnet. He attached these magnets at the back, uh, electrically powered back here. And you can see at the bottom, you can just barely make out, but there's all these small fragments of meteorites uh, with his finger here pointing that he's collected by just dragging this back and forth, back and forth across the plains. And then he came back a year later and he had what they called an electrobalanced instrument. And you can see it's attached to the engine of his car. He's listening, his son Bob is listening to this. And it's kind of kind of like a very large uh, metal detector. And uh, again, he found all kinds. They said within within 10 minutes of starting this up, uh, they found a three pound meteorite buried eight inches down. And so he was, again, the first to use these types of uh, instruments to find uh, iron meteorites. And then uh, he was, uh, again, in Kansas, he, and he was talking to a farmer, and he said, well, I think I found a meteorite. He said, actually, this big stone in my field broke the tip of my plow. And so he went out there, and they started digging, and he found the 749-pound stony meteorite, right, along with 21 pounds of fragments that probably got knocked off from the plow. And uh, the mass represented the second largest known stony meteorite in the world at the time. Uh, and even as of 2016, it was the fifth most massive of over 8,000 stony meteorites uh, of its class in the world. And so he always liked to dress up <laughs> for uh, his pictures. So you'll often see him with, with tie and, and hat and jackets on. And then uh, this is what started the whole thing for me was uh, that he, he bought uh, the Camp Verde meteorite. Uh, we have it on display at the center now. It's uh, about two feet this way, a foot high, five inches at the base, tapers to a point at the top. It was found by an Indian relic hunter, which we would call a pot hunter today. And uh, it was found in a stone-lined cyst in a ruin along Clear Creek, east of Camp Verde, and it was wrapped in a turkey feather blanket. And so Niger wouldn't, uh, wouldn't buy it until the guy who found it took him to where it was found. And so this is... Uh, uh, Edward Dawson, who found it, and he's standing in the hole uh, where he found it. Uh, and there was a lot of debate as to where it was. Uh, we eventually were able to match the surrounding landscape, and we confirmed that it was what's now called the John Heath ruin. And when you go in there, uh, there's still, you can see the depression, you can still see the lines, and there's a slab off to the side, uh, side that would have covered it. And so, uh, um, the feather blanket, you know, we wanted to figure, oh, where could the feather blanket be? And I found a little note from uh, from this Dawson that said, uh, well, he had this Indian relic shop in Phoenix, and he didn't know what to do with it. So he cut the whole thing up into three squares and gave it away to people who bought some of his artifacts. So unfortunately, it's, it's nowhere. Now, what's, what's important is this is, when it was analyzed by ASU, determined to be from Meteor Crater. And so that brings me to Meteor Crater, um, which he spent 16 years uh, studying it. And there's Candy Diablo in the background here, San Francisco Peaks, and then the crater itself. Um, and it was formed 50,000 years ago by a 300-ton meteorite. Uh, it's 4,000 4, feet wide, 600 feet deep, uh, and one of the best world-preserved meteorite impacts in the world. Uh, the astronauts trained in there before they landed on the moon. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, U.S. Geological Survey was in there in 1891 and concluded that it was created by volcanic magma that had heated a pocket of water, resulting in a steam explosion. And the reason was there was almost no meteorites found within the center. If it were created by a big meteorite, you would expect to find a whole bunch of pieces. And instead, there were, all, there were a lot of meteorite fragments or iron meteorite uh, all around the place, actually for nine miles around the crater. And when they asked, well, how does that square with that? They said, well, it's incidental and must have been other meteorites that hit 
but it wasn't the crater. So, uh, so USGS did not believe it for, for a long time. Uh, but then this fellow, Daniel Moreau Berenger, came along, and uh, he uh, graduated from Princeton at age 19 among his classmates with Cyrus McCormick and Woodrow Wilson. He then went to the University of Pennsylvania, got a law degree by 22, and with a partner, they wrote the book Law of Mines and Mining in the United States in 1897. And he met a, a woman from Pierce, Arizona, fell in love, and moved to Pierce, Arizona. And while he was there, he uh, partnered with somebody, and they opened up a silver mine down there. Uh, and when they had the mines down there, because of the timber being used for, the, for showing up the mines, uh, the Forest Service would inspect these mines, wanting to find out whether or not they had permits to, to cut down the trees or whether these were illegal, uh, illegal logs uh, uh, in these mines. And so the mine inspector was studying his mine and they were sitting down having coffee and he started telling them about this supposed meteor crater up by Flagstaff. And he got totally in, 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 uh, enthralled with it and learned about it, studied that he was convinced that it was in fact created by a meteor. And if in fact it was, it could be worth millions and millions of dollars if there was this humongous iron core in the center that he could melt down. And so he, he formed the Standard Iron Company, and then he uh, laid claim uh, to four uh, plots, 640 acres each, uh, around the crater. He called them Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, but he put them in the name of his uh, uh, brother-in-laws um, so that people would know that Berenger was doing this because he was afraid that, that knowing his reputation that people would go running up there and making all kinds of other claims before he could really uh, source it out. And so uh, this is a map that he had uh, drawn. And as you can see, you know, there's almost no meteorites at all within the crater here, but there's all these meteorites all over the place. Um, and, and that helped convince him that there was buried deep within the crater was this huge core that actually created it. And so for the next years or next, uh, for the next uh, 10 years or so, he dug over 30 shafts uh, to find the meteorite and, and, and spent upwards of $600,000, which in today's dollars will be almost 10 million, uh, exclusive of interest. Uh, and on his own personal funds, he spent 120,000, which is close to 2 million of his personal funds. And after all these 30 shafts, never found anything. He found quicksand, he found water, uh, it uh, there was maybe pieces down there that broke the tips of some of the shafts, but they could never, uh, never confirm anything. And so a lot of this was, uh, the, a lot of that 600,000 was by investors. And so after 30 shafts and not finding anything, investors were really kind of cool. And then to see here, 1929, that's the beginning of the Great Depression. And so the investors pulled out. And so he had no more funds to continue digging after 1929. And within a few months, he died of heart failure. And uh, his son believes that it was because of uh, the fact that he had abandoned the uh, mine. Uh, but Nyinger visited it in 25, as I said earlier, also 1928, several times when he was in Denver. And here he is with his magnetic break. And he's, there's the crater over here in the background. And there's this trailer. And he just covered the whole area around, the whole nine, 10 miles around, collecting meteorite fragments. Uh, in 34, he met this fellow, Herbert Fales, um, who had a plane. And uh, he offered a flag over the Southwest looking for more craters, because he heard about the fascination with craters. And between 1934 and 36, uh, this is uh, in the picture to the left. There's the plane. Uh, this is uh, this is Herbert Fales. This is his wife. Uh, this is the photographer pilot, and this is the camera that he used. And that's Nanninger there. And so they flew over, covered over 2,000 miles, uh, covering four states, looking for uh, craters. And this is actually Nanninger's picture of the crater taken in 1934. So he was really into into the craters. Um, so here was his first book, 1933. This is one of the books that he would trade for meteorites. Uh, it was one of the first meteorites uh, talking about it. And he mentions Candy Diablo meteorite at least six times in the book. So again, he's fascinated by it. Uh, and then in 42, he wrote another book, The Comet Strikes the Earth, How to Recognize Meteorites, Visitors from Space. Uh, and in the center of it, there's a little fragment of a meteorite over in the corner here that he would sell. So, 
And when you open it up, there was a centerfold and it showed the whole area around Media Crater and, and where the crater was. So uh, again, he was fascinated. And so here, uh, he, as it says here, he believed that the factual data on the crater was inadequate and that a thorough study of the distribution of the meteoric materials around the crater would help to interpret what actually happened and what created the crater. And he spent the next 16 years around the crater collecting and analyzing data. And here's, I think this is a great picture. This is a picture of him sitting on the edge looking out over the crater. So you just, you know, where he spent the next 16 years of his life. Uh, you may not have noticed, but in the early picture uh, that was done by uh, U.S. Geological Survey, they actually identified four Indian ruins on the south and east side of the crater. And when we were studying this to decide how did the meteor crater, how did the Kenny Dablo uh, or the uh, Camp Verde meteorite and several others get down into the Verde Valley area? One possibility was that there was, they were collecting it at the crater and trading it. And so I actually got a permit to go and look at the four ruins to see if there were any evidence of meteorites with, associated with it. One was excavated by the University of New Mexico in 1950, and their notes have absolutely no mention of any meteorite fragments whatsoever connected with it. And I couldn't find any in, in the other ruins either. So he uh, spent the next uh, 16 years studying crater, and he finally wrote a book in 1956, and it summarized the information available at the time. He described the early history of it, outlined his theory of its formation, he covered uh, research and surveys that have been carried out. He speculated on the nature of the event when meteorites hit the earth. And he ends with a list of 28 possible research projects to, cont to continue. He was already, at, at this point, he was uh, in his uh, uh, late 70s. And so his field work was kind of dwindling. But uh, with Meteor Crater, uh, and, and uh, I'll be expanding this because uh, on June 30th, June 30th is International Asteroid. Day, and uh, planetariums around the world uh, give all kind of lectures and demonstrations about asteroids, comets, and meteorites on June 30th. And uh, Lowell Observatory is doing uh, is doing a program on that day with Meteor Crater. So there will be all kind of programs at Meteor Crater from around 10 a.m. to about 5 p.m. And I've been asked to give this talk, but actually talking more about the Kenny Diablo and Meteor Crater uh, impact. And in the evening from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., Lowell is doing more uh, evening uh, observations and other programs. So daytime at the crater, evening over at, at, uh, at Lowell. So these are just some, uh, some of his discoveries. He discovered, uh, and you'd have to could spend a whole day just on this. He discovered uh, spheroids and pactites. Uh, and this, this one in particular, he, at the bottom, he predicted creosite, a form of silicon uh, dioxide created when very high pressure and moderately high temperature are applied to quartz, that they, these must be present in various meteorite, and, and must be present in various meteorite craters, including the Arizona crater, where it was discovered three years later. So he predicted that you have to have creosite uh, to prove that this particular crater was created by a meteor hitting the earth with high temperature and high pressure. And uh, unfortunately, when he came up with this, he was barred from visiting Meteor Crater. Um, he did a very silly thing. Uh, he started a petition to nationalize Meteor Crater without talking to the owners. And when the owners heard about that, they said, bye-bye, uh, you can't come here anymore to study. So he got cut off. Uh, but uh, three years after he wrote this book and made this prediction, uh, Eugene Shoemaker found creosite around Meteor Crater, which then proved that it was created by, by a meteorite. So unfortunately, Eugene Shoemaker gets credit for proving it, uh, but it was based on a prediction by, by Nineker. Uh, so he wanted to show his collection. He had one of the largest collections, and some of you may have seen these old pictures of the original museum at the end of Meteor Crater. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of articles, a lot of websites say that Daniger built it. He didn't. Uh, and so it was actually built by a fellow named uh, Harry Locke. Uh, he uh, was in World War I. He was actually a cartoonist. He opened a studio in Phoenix, went up to visit the crater, fell in love with it. And he opened up a gas station right on Route 66 on the road to Meteor Crater. And he always wanted to create a museum of the meteorites. And so he actually built this. this. Most of it was built by hand, by himself. Uh, here it is under construction. I have three or four more, 
more photos from Winslow of another construction. And here's how it is finished. <clears throat> and here's his card. Uh, he had meter specimens, literature, continual lectures pertaining to the world's famous meter crater. Uh, and, and it's got Harry Locke, uh, lecturer. So he uh, wrote the first booklet, uh, brochure on Meteor Crater. It's actually a 16-page booklet. It's um, unbelievable. And because he was a cartoonist, it's filled with all these diagrams of, of the, the crater, where the different shafts were sunk, uh, the, the, the little house that was there at the time, somebody created uh, shafts that were done outside. So he did all of this, and uh, he also, in the gas station, he built this replica of what the crater was like. And, um, and so, uh, unfortunately, um, he, well, then he moved this, this, he sold the gas station in order to get the money to build the, media, uh, the uh, observatory, uh, but he was building it during the Great Depression. And so people visiting it were not uh, enough. And so eventually he ended up uh, going into foreclosure and lost everything. Uh, he then became a, a police officer with Winslow, uh, and a couple years later, unfortunately, he was uh, killed by a drunk uh, that he was trying to arrest. But he was the one that actually built the building uh, after he it was abandoned for several years. Uh, it was uh, leased as an Indio Curio shop, and um, and actually it had a very very dubious reputation. It's kind of a, as it says in the book, a jip joint. And so uh, it, a lot of people didn't want to visit there. So even when Nininger decided he was going to move there, and when he was looking for a place, as it says here, he decided that uh, they would provide their own institution because he couldn't get anybody to, to take his collection. No, Smithsonian didn't want it. Harvard didn't want it. Uh, Amherst didn't want it. He tried a whole bunch of places. Nobody wanted it. And he decided he had to create his own institution, his own museum. Uh, and he always wanted to live near Media Crater. And he knew Harry Locke. Uh, they exchanged uh, meteorites. They had exchanged books and things. And so uh, uh, he wanted to create uh, at Harry's uh, place the first and only museum of its kind. It would be run on a high educational plane. So in the summer of 46, he moved the trailer to the base of Mount Eldon, east of Flagstaff, and began to look for the places. But he was familiar with, with Locke's place. And so he actually um, uh, uh, signed a lease in 1946 and opened it up in October of 1946. He made some improvements. Uh, this was actually open air at the top, and Locke actually had a telescope there because the crater was not open to the public at the time. And so for 25 cents, you could go up, up, the, uh, up the tower and you could look through the telescope to see the crater in the distance. Uh, and one of the things uh, that also caused Locke to, to uh, close down, not only the lack of people, but right at the end there, he was about ready to make a decision to uh, quit, uh, he, he didn't live in this building. He had to live in Winslow, so he would lock up and then go back. Well, unfortunately, somebody broke in and stole the telescope, which was the main attraction. And so, you know, between that and the, the depression, he just went to foreclosure and lost it. So Nanninger closed up the windows at the top. He put up better uh, these uh, cinder blocks or what do you call those uh, glass blocks in the front and uh, made some improvements. And this is what it looked like on the inside on Route 66. Uh, originally he had, uh, in, obviously Indian, uh, uh, carpets on the walls and he had all these display cases of, of meteorites. Here he is. Remember the Houghton meteorite? This is the Houghton meteorite. And he's putting the sign up on display. Here he's talking to a bunch of tourists, you know, about different meteorites that, and what they're all about. Well, uh, when I-40 was built, uh, visitation declined because he was on Route 66. People were bypassing Route 66. So he was going downhill fast. And unfortunately, fortunately, he met two people from Sedona that said, well, we'll, we'll, write, we'll fund a museum for you if you move it to Sedona. And so I've not been able to find out who these people are <laughs> and what their motivation was. I keep digging and asking around, but haven't found out who yet. But they funded it and, um, and basically wrote him a loan. Basically, they, they gave him a loan to build it. And here it is under construction. Um, right, and if you're familiar with where it's at, this is this is how it looked. Over to the one side was is the current Sedona Art Museum, which was right up abutted it, and on the right side is now the Royal Robles Best Western Motel. But this is what it looked like at the time, 
And it didn't look much different than his other place. Uh, the only thing that he was proud of was in the uh, uh, building on, on Route 66, the floor was rock. And so very uneven, hard to clean. Uh, people would trip on it. And so he got this new fancy floor called Formica uh, for the floor in the new museum. So he was all excited about that. So here's a couple of pictures of that. And he would give evening lectures and formal tours. Uh, and admission was uh, 50 cents and 25 cents for kids. Um, so this continued for quite a while. Here's some more pictures of it. Uh, and he thought that Sedona would become a tourist town. Well, unfortunately, at the time he did this in 1953, it wasn't yet a tourist town. In fact, they didn't discover water in West Sedona until 1955. And so um, it was still mostly abandoned. And he, he mentions it as he was kind of uh, autobiography. Uh, disappointed in Sedona because he thought it was become a bunch of families would come visit, see the museum. And he was disappointed that basically uh, it was only artists and old people that were retiring uh, and they weren't that interested in the museum. So, uh, so it's changed obviously, but uh, th at that time it was not good. So, um, so when he would uh, have the visitors in the summer months, uh, he would get pretty good, but the visitors in the winter were very, very bad. But the, the volume of visitors in the summer were, was not enough to have enough of a cushion to carry through the winter months. And so they decided in, in 57 and 58 that they needed to just sell part of the collection to keep going. And so the British Museum of Natural History decided they wanted to get some of this. So they just took these specimens from 680 falls, which was basically 21% of the collection. And uh, they bought it in 58, value was $158,000, <clears> which at the time was about $1.6 million. So a pretty good chunk of change at the time. And here's a picture of their website. If you go to their website even today uh, and you type in their meteorite collection, this is what will pop up. And it's a slice that shows you of the Canny Diablo meteorite and the different crystalline patterns that, that helps identify it. Uh, I was very disappointed uh, with them. Um, they had 21% of the collection, so I thought, well, it'd be kind of cool to get a picture or two of the meteorites that he sold to them uh, and put it in the book. And when I contacted them, they were very prompt to get it back to us and said, well, we, yes, we did buy this in 1958, but we have not yet cataloged it. And so here we got 50 years later, it's still sitting in boxes somewhere in there. And uh, I said, well, can you at least find a couple uh, that, that you know you have that he didn't sell to anybody else. And they said, well, you'd have to tell us what those are because we don't know. And I just didn't have the time or the energy to do that. So then I said, well, how about this picture? You got this slice of Candy Diablo and it's from, uh, is that one of the pieces that he sold you? And they came back and said, well, we don't even know that. So uh, they, were, they were not terribly helpful, but they wanted to see the book <laughs> when it got done. So whatever, but they were not that helpful. Well, from that money, uh, he was able to uh, pay off the loan, uh, keep the museum open for another year or two. Uh, he bought some land up on a hilltop in Sedona. He hired this architect uh, to build his house with a lot of features that at the time were very modern. And it's now, uh, the house is now on the uh, Sedona uh, list of landmark structures. Um, but you can't visit it. It's owned by different, not family members anymore, but the plaque is still there. And so when uh, ASU heard about the sale to the British Museum, they got very upset. And so they, uh, uh, they wanted to get in on the action. And so uh, they were able to uh, get some money from their ASU foundation. Herbert Fales, remember the, the guy who flew him around? He was still around. He gave a donation. And then the National Science Foundation also gave them some money. So they bought the bulk of this collection, seven and a half tons, for $275,000, which is equivalent of about close to $3 million today. And so it's right now, uh, this is the uh, repository. This is the vault there. All these green doors back here is nothing but Neiniger's Canyon Diablo collection. Uh, it's large pieces, small pieces, fragments, bags, jars, a lot of which he never had a chance to go through, just waiting for some student to go in there and start making new discoveries. Uh, but it's all back there. And all the rest of these are a part of their collection from around the world of other. Uh, they have one of the largest, if not the largest university media collection in the world. So it's quite, it's quite a place. So even though he retired, he kept writing. So he wrote a book, uh, Ask a Question About Meteorites. 
Uh, he had uh, 87 pages with 32 pages of photographs, a lot of questions, you know, what is a meteorite, what is it made of, et cetera, uh, which became very popular. Uh, he really wanted meteorite study to be part of a high school curriculum, so he put together this meteorite creator study kit that had meteorite fragments, uh, 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 impact heights, uh, spheroids, uh, the booklet, whatever in here, sold this is the box that it came in, uh, and he sold it for a few years, but it never really took off. Uh, and then his autobiography, Find a Falling Star, he wrote in 72. And as I said, 254 pages, but it was all over 1,000 uh, typed pages, which would have been over 500, 500 pages if it were printed. And the publisher just didn't want to do it. So, uh, that's, so what I'm hoping is my book kind of fills in some of the gaps. And so we finally got some honors. Uh, he, uh, he established the Niagara Meteorite Award. Uh, basically, every, every year, students who study meteorites can apply for research grants up to $2,000. Uh, they found a unique mineral within some uh, meteorites, uh, and so they named it the Ninagerite as the mineral that's in it. He finally got a couple PhDs. He was always called Dr. Ninager, but he only had a master's degree. Uh, but he, McPherson gave him an honorary, Pomona gave him an honorary, and actually in 1982, uh, they found a asteroid uh, that was flying around and Lowell Observatory found it and they named it after him. Uh, it's called uh, Minor Planet 2421 Niniger. So he has that. And so uh, to end it, uh, that's him in, uh, surrounded by, as I like to say, his friends. Um, he died in Colorado after a short illness in 1986 at the age of 99. Uh, shortly after Haley's Comet, uh, which he had been looking forward to see. So he probably hung on just long enough to see Haley's Comet and then, then passed on. And this is what the museum looks like today. This is Meteor Crater. This is what it looks like. There's hardly anything left of it. Um, and then this is what was the Sedona Meteorite Museum. It's now part, it was converted to six uh, hotel rooms. That's part of the Royal Robust Best Western on this side. And here's the Sedona Arts Center over here. And so thank you for your attention. Well, thanks for that presentation. That was uh, extremely interesting. I didn't know we had that much history on meteorites. Uh, too bad that the museum went down in Sedona uh, and his collection uh, was divided up. And it is a shame, you know, they, and, and you can't really see it. Um, you know, uh, we were very, very lucky to, to get... Uh, the okay to borrow these uh, since the museum uh, has been approved by, well, Arizona State came up and did a study of our museum and said that we were quote unquote highly qualified to receive collections from private uh, state and federal lands. And so that kind of opened up doors. So we've got, uh, we've got stuff on loan from the Scottsdale Museum of the West, from the Tucson Museum of Art uh, from Arizona State. And right now, um, you probably have not heard this yet. We have uh, we are uh, writing a contract with the Grand Canyon National Park Repository. Many people don't even know that they have a repository. They have a repository of archaeological artifacts found in the Canyon Park uh, that have never, ever, ever been displayed. They have no place to display them. So they have this repository. And because we are the national, uh, the official nonprofit partner of the National Park Service, we are going to be getting a 20 to 30 artifacts from the Grand Canyon Repository, and we'll have a new exhibit in October of uh, archaeology of the Grand Canyon. Um, and so um, getting all these loans just opens up the door to more loans like that. So, but uh, getting back to the topic, if anybody has any questions on meteorites, be happy to answer any. Uh, well, I think you uh, explained everything really okay. well. <laughs> Okay, no. So, um, yeah, so the, uh, the book's on Amazon and the book is in the uh, center as well. Okay. Um, so, uh, is that interesting? Deb, did you have a question? No, no, I was well, just saying so thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. My pleasure. Yeah, I've got one uh, for uh, Ken. Uh, Ken. Richard and I have gone out in the sinks out there what? and dragged a magnet behind us. And we pick up little 
BB sized uh, magnetic spherical objects. Uh, any idea what those might be? Yeah, well, um, uh, when you see a, a shooting star, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, and the sequence, by the way, is when they're traveling throughout the universe, it's either an asteroid or a comet, depending on whether it has a tail or not. And then as it, it gets close to the Earth, it's a meteor. Uh, so when you see a shooting star, that's a meteor streaking across the sky. And if it survives and lands on the Earth, it's called a meteorite. Now, that shooting stars that like, look like they go puff, puff in the, in the sky, uh, it's still matter. And they estimate that over 100,000 tons of meteoritic dust falls on the Earth every year. Uh, it never stops. And it's every part of the world. It doesn't just, you know, you, meteorites are falling, shooting stars are during the day. You just can't see them. Um, and so I often tell hiking clubs, put little magnets on the end of your hiking sticks. And I'll bet you by the time you get back uh, over a few hikes, you'll have these little magnetic uh, items at the base. And so, yes, so if you found these little magnetic and they're kind of spheroid, um, that could very well be these, uh, what's it called, spheroids. They're, they're part of a exploding uh, shooting star. And so, um, you know, they're magnetic. Um, the only really way to tell for sure is uh, ASU has an atomic accelerator that we've used a couple of times where you can put a small sample in this little case and it zaps it in a millisecond and it'll give you the chemical composition of it. Um, but looking at it, you know, it if it's is it shiny looking uh, and magnetic, it, it could very well be a, a meteoritic spheroid. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, the ones we find are normally black. Right. Um, of course, if they've been out there, they'll be oxidized and maybe have other chemicals in them. Right, right. So it could very well be, you know, so I, I'll, I'll do follow up talks. You know, I, I give these talks to astronomy clubs and I'll tell them that and I'll do return visits. And now people come up to me with these little vials, you know, they have all this you know, magnetic <laughs> shiny material. In it. So they're, they're having fun with it, at least. Very good. Very good. Well, Ken, uh, with that, um, I want to thank you again for giving this great presentation. Uh, it was very informative, and I think it uh, kicked off a lot of interest here. Oh, good, good. And, and like I mentioned, uh, if, if you're up in that area, you're not that far from Meteor Crater. If there's interest, uh, there's, as I said, June 30th is International uh, Asteroid Day, and they have a whole day of programs and lectures up there. So uh, you can just do Lowell Observatory uh, uh, Asteroid Day, and it'll bring up the, the schedule and everything. Okay, well, very good. Okay. Well, if nobody has anything else to add to that, I'll uh, go ahead and end the meeting. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thanks again, Ken, for uh, your great presentation. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you, Ken. Take care.